once again to another edition of Good Books. I'm your host this week, Dr. John Cook, and with me today is Dr. Nick Freudenberg, who's a distinguished professor of public health at City University of New York School of Public Health and Hunter College, and founder and director of Corporations and Health Watch, an international network of activists and researchers that monitors the business practices of the alcohol, automobile, firearms, food and beverage, pharmaceutical, and tobacco industries. Nick, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here today. You know, this is a very interesting read. It actually uh, provoked some discussion in, in one of my classes. The, the, the name of the book is Lethal But Legal, Corporations' Consumption and Protecting Public Health. Um, you are a, a public health researcher. and is, Yes. Uh, this is something that is very near and dear to your heart. How long has this, uh, this organization, um, uh, Corporations and Health Watch, been around? It's been around for about uh, seven or eight years. And it's really a network of researchers, uh, activists, uh, health professionals who are concerned about the health impact of those six industries that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And we chose those six because they're important parts of the global consumer economy, and they're also the industries that uh, make a disproportionate contribution to premature deaths and preventable illnesses and injuries. Yeah, you talk uh, early on about the the decisions made by the executives and managers in those industries impact uh, our health, our lifestyle, our economy, international trade, and political systems, and that impact is growing. Yes. Uh, There are really two uh, major and growing causes of death in the United States and around the world. Uh, one of them is chronic diseases, uh, conditions like heart disease, stroke, diabetes, uh, some forms of cancer, and the other is injuries, uh, particularly injuries related to automobiles, firearms, and also in a different way, alcohol. And uh, in the United States, chronic diseases uh, account for three out of every four dollars we spend on health care. Forty-nine percent of Americans have one or more chronic conditions. Uh, Injuries are the leading cause of death of young people everywhere around the world. And so if we're going to achieve our national health goals and our global health goals, we're going to need to do something about uh, chronic diseases and injuries. And the case I make in the book is that it is the business practices and the political practices of these six industries that are a primary driver of the increases in chronic diseases and injuries. We won't have time to do them all, but I would like to dissect a a very uh, well-researched case for each of those. Uh, You you call them chronic diseases, which is the most common name, but they're also called non-communicable diseases uh, because... And I think that marks a change from the last century when the leading causes of death were uh, communicable or infectious diseases like uh, influenza and tuberculosis and pneumonia. And in many parts of the world, uh, HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis are still important causes of death, but even in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, chronic conditions, non-communicable diseases, are the fastest growing and will soon be the, ma- the major cause of death everywhere. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, in in picking an industry to to go through uh, how you've uh, researched it, I I felt like we had to do, because we're on the border between the two most obese nations, Mexico and the United States, I thought we should do the food and and beverage corporations, because uh, interesting, the the discussion of hyperpalatable foods and the blend of fat, salt, and sugar to create conditioned overeating. Yes, and there are stories... uh, in that that are important to that border region. So let me first talk about uh, hyperpalatable food, and then I want to talk a little about NAFTA and the North American Free Trade Agreement mm-hmm. and its influence on the diet of people both in this country and in Mexico. So hyperpalatable foods are foods that are, have blended together uh, sugar, fat, salt, and we use the term hyperpalatable to say that they're just very attractive to people. And the reason for that is that humans evolved uh, in times of scarcity. And so stoking up on sugar, fat, and salt uh, conferred uh, survival advantages uh, in the times that humans evolved because scarcity was the 
was the norm. And so when you came upon uh, one of these nutrients, you took as much as you could because you might not get it tomorrow or next week or next month. But what conferred survival advantages in those times now puts us at risk of chronic diseases, that salt, fat, and sugar are major contributors to diet-related diseases. And what the food industry has done is to make these products ubiquitous, put them within reach of every child and adult in this nation uh, through federal policies that subsidized uh, the crops that are the foundation of hyperpalatable products, made them cheap, cheaper than healthy food. And so now what used to confer advantage puts us at risk of death. Mm -hmm. And the food industry has manipulated that vulnerability, particularly in children, and that's been a major contributor to the uh, staggering rise in obesity and diabetes in our nation over the last three decades. You know, at, at some point, I, I, I remember that you mentioned the various sciences that they use to develop powerful marketing programs, and you mentioned here ab about the brain circuits rewarding binges of these particular magic products, salt, sugar, and fat. Uh, but it, you also use the word hedonic impulses, and I think that's very telling. I think, you know, that, that we really do... Uh, have a, a, a craving for pleasure, and it's so readily available everywhere. Yes, and, and it's really uh, uh, encouraged by the advertising of the food industry, and in other ways I talk about in the book also the alcohol and tobacco industries, mm -hmm. so that we are bombarded with messages encouraging us to consume, and then we have these products that are uh, hedonic, habituating, or in the case of alcohol and tobacco, frankly, addicting. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't need to mention all of the corporations that are involved, but there's some huge ones. But the, uh, the, the description of the Cinnabon really got to me because I, I remember every time I'm in an airport, that smell makes me crave one. I've never had one, and I didn't know, as you say in the book, that it's um, 880 calories, 36 grams of fat, 59 grams of sugar, 830 milligrams of sodium, and that there's, you know, high fructose corn syrup and salt and soy oil and 45 other ingredients along with the brown sugar and cream cheese and bun. Right. And uh, as you mentioned, it was scientists uh, who helped Cinnabon uh, uh, create that product, scientists, food scientists, uh, neuroscientists, social psychologists, and another uh, realization that I came to in writing this book is in the previous centuries, science was used to advance humanity and to protect public health. It was scientists who helped us get clean water and sanitation and safer food and drugs to people that contributed to the spectacular advances in public health of the late 19th and uh, first part of the 20th century. But today, unfortunately, too much of science is appropriated by industry and used to sell their products, uh, often products that put our health at risk. Yeah, the, the neuroscience notes really made me un unnerved because I, I believe that they could actually implant these things in my brain without my knowing it. Yes, yes, to track our uh, brain impulses in order to sell us products. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember Very. that one of the studies you cited was that kids eating the same food from McDonald's, if it was in a plain wrapper, they preferred it less than if it was in a McDonald's wrapper. Yes, That's yes, and, and that shows the conditioning that even very young children uh, receive from advertisers. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen, especially in the last decade, is companies like uh, McDonald's and uh, Kellogg's and General Mills are looking to develop new forms of advertising using social media and the Internet and cell phones that bypass parental control uh, in order to encourage children to consume these high-sugar, high-fat, high-salt products. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to leave out Coke and PepsiCo because there's a lot of interesting stuff about them. I, I didn't realize how much of the chips market PepsiCo owned. Um, but yes, that, <laughs> PepsiCo is really a multi-food company, and they uh, distinguish between uh, good-for-you products, which is their new line, and uh, fun products. Uh, and I call those fun products, which are high fat, sugar, and salt, make you sicker quicker uh, products. And what PepsiCo does is it puts out these uh, good for you products uh, as a way of deflecting criticism. Uh, 
and the argument they say is this gives people choice. Mm -hmm. But in fact, if you look at where their profits come from and where their marketing dollars go, it's on these fun for you products that are most associated with uh, obesity and diabetes. Mm -hmm. And even their diet drinks contribute to metabolic diseases, so we've got uh, no way out here from this. Pro I, th I also found it interesting that you talked about the yellow dust makes Cheetos more attractive. But, uh, yes, and that was a uh, neuroscientist who put actually uh, uh, electrodes on people's head to see how they reacted to this yellow dust. And apparently the yellow dust in Cheetos triggers some uh, pleasure stimuli that makes them particularly attractive, even though that yellow dust is uh, artificial additives that uh, some researchers believe uh, have some uh, uh, harmful properties. Mm -hmm. And I guess part of the, the the issue we face is that sometimes there's not conclusive evidence. You know, there's there's a sodium for years has been a, a bad guy, but uh, we're n we're not absolutely certain what the exact effects of sodium are. Isn't that correct? Yes, and and you know uh, when we're exposed to so many products, it's sometimes difficult for scientists to uh, come to. Uh, 100% sure conclusions, but I think what we see with the industry, and the tobacco industry was a master in this, but unfortunately the food and pharmaceutical industry are borrowing from it. Uh, someone in the tobacco industry said, doubt is our product, mm -hmm. and they used uh, scientific uncertainty, or they in fact created that uncertainty in order to thwart public health regulations, and we've seen that same strategy used by other industries to create doubt even when there is when the when the weight of the evidence suggests that a particular product is harmful mm -hmm. and unlike a court of law where we presume people are innocent until they're proven guilty in the consumer market it would make much more sense to use what folks in public health call the precautionary principle which says you don't uh, release a product into the market and expose millions or even billions of people to it until you know it's safe. Mm -hmm. That's a very different set of standards from our criminal justice system. And what the, uh, the big corporations are saying is, unless someone has proven our product guilty, we should be able to market it as we see fit. Mm -hmm. That's not good public health policy, and that's contributed to some of the dangerous pharmaceutical, food, uh, and other products that we've seen. Mm -hmm. You touched on several things there I'd like to follow up on, but I wanted to mention that there's a, there's a great chart in there uh, early on, a public health evidence from the CDC and the World Health Organization that show the estimated annual deaths from these industries. And uh, with food and beverage that we've been talking about, the deaths may come from obesity, diabetes, and heart disease, and some cancers. And that's about 216,000 deaths per year in the U.S. attributed to overweight and obesity issues. Uh, and over three million worldwide, and that's just the food industry. But uh, you mentioned tobacco, and I really want to look at them and how they use lobbying and political clout because they uh, they really knew how to play this game, even down to when they were you know nailed for the the big uh, 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 lawsuit where they made a settlement. But uh, especially Philip Morris companies knew how to yes. get 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 yes. out there and get things I think done. Tobacco uh, is both a partial success story and shows some of the uh, limitations of public health advocacy. So the success is here in the United States in the last 50 years, uh, we've cut smoking rates in half from more than 40% of the adult population to uh, less than 20%. And that's a huge success and it means that we've saved millions of lives, uh, prevented suffering, and we've also uh, help many young people avoid taking up the habit in the first place. So that's uh, a really important victory. But the estimates are that worldwide about 100 million people uh, died prematurely as a result of tobacco use in the 20th century. And the estimates are in the 21st century we'll see 1 billion premature deaths. And shame on us that we allowed the tobacco industry to take the lessons they had learned on promoting their product and thwarting public health regulation in this country to Africa, Asia, and Latin America, where the bulk of tobacco deaths are expected in this century. Mm -hmm. And we really need to do 
a much better job in seeing this uh, fight for health and safety to be a global struggle and to allow companies to take their practices to other parts of the world uh, simply isn't acceptable. Mm-hmm. Well, you mentioned some of the, the the things that they did that, that, that seemed to work so well for them in, in, the, in the states, and that includes marketing low-tar cigarettes and uh, uh, suggesting that they would be safer, and uh, uh, Virginia Slims, the marketing to women who were a, a, lo- a lower percent of market share. Um, what else? Oh, oh, hiding the fact that nicotine was addictive so well for a while. And they've right. taken that overseas, and even though the World Health Organization has something called the Global Framework Convention on Tobacco Control that nearly 200, was it 176 nations have mm-hmm. uh, have signed off on. They've still managed to exert their political clout in countries like Mexico, which has signed it, which is part of why Carlos Slim is the world's wealthiest man. Yes, yes. And again, I think the Framework Convention is a partial success and shows how challenging it is to control these uh, big corporations. It's one of the first uh, public health treaties, and uh, it provides very clear markers for nations to follow to protect their population from uh, tobacco-related illness. And many countries have made substantial progress uh, in achieving those uh, measures Uh, reducing advertising, not allowing the tobacco industry to participate in setting public health policy, and so on. But the tobacco industry has used uh, trade agreements uh, and the uh, World Trade Organization and the legal mechanisms for settling uh, trade disputes to circumvent some of the stipulations of the framework convention. And that's really the fight that we see playing out now. In Australia, the tobacco industry lost, and Australia now has very aggressive uh, package labels that warn of the uh, the dangers from tobacco. And Australia is uh, seen as one of the countries most likely to virtually eliminate tobacco use in the next few decades. And that term is is taken to mean getting it down below 5 or 10 percent of the population. And what we ought to be doing is looking at how we can achieve that goal in many other countries, including uh, low-income and middle-income nations that have such a high burden of tobacco-related diseases that will really stymie their economic development. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, as I said, we don't have time to go through them all in the de- detail that I wanted to go through the food and beverage, but you, you mentioned automobile corporations and how they sort of have pushed back on regulation when they could have made automobiles uh, – safer and uh, uh, more uh, cleaner, but they always tried to resist those regulations. But, but recently we've seen some success in terms of lowering the number of deaths in the United States that are really related to automobiles. Yes, we've, we, uh, since the National Highway Transportation and Safety Act was passed in 1966, uh, the death rate from uh, automobile injuries has been cut more than in half, and that is a, uh, shows that regulations can contribute to saving lives. Okay. Uh, however, other countries have done much better than the United States, and we still have a ways to go. And I think the recent uh, episode where General Motors didn't uh, reveal to uh, public agencies that it knew that their cobalt ignition switches were contributing to uh, deaths is an example that the auto industry still has a ways to go around public safety. Yes, and uh, they certainly designed themselves an excellent out with the with the bankruptcy help that they got. Um, but e- even uh, th- today, they promote the SUVs, which are not as safe and, and emit more carbon that's damaging the planet than, uh, than regular automobiles do. Yes, and, and I think it's a good illustration of how uh, blockbuster products, products that uh, will make big profits for an industry, often put public health at risk. And SUVs bring profits 10 to 12 times higher than a sedan to the automobile industry. So particularly in the 1990s, uh, the automobile industry looked to SUVs to save them from the competition 
of European and Japanese car makers who were making more efficient uh, cars. And so they designed these huge vehicles, spent billions of dollars promoting them, uh, tried to convince people they were safer when, in fact, uh, the opposite was true, and they were, they were also much more polluting. Mm -hmm. And so within a few years, they became the best-selling vehicles in the United States. Now, the uh, economic downturn uh, put a dent in the SUV market, but recently we began seeing that SUVs and light trucks are big selling, and the auto industry can't help itself from advertising them uh, because they're so profitable. Mm -hmm. And there's also a good treatment in, in the book about the pharmaceutical corporations and how they misrepresented risk and how they uh, uh, had basically co-opted doctors by, you know, selling to them hard sell and even uh, preventing generic drug makers from making it by paying for the delay to let out the generic product so they can continue to make profits. And that one's very disturbing to me because as I grow older, I think about needing more medications and having to trust a, a pharmaceutical industry that manipulates the system. But I wanted yes, to turn. And, and oh. as with tobacco, that's also a global health problem. Mm -hmm. There are uh, a few billion people in the world who don't have access to essential medicines. And one of the main reasons that they don't have access to the medicines that could save their lives is the pharmaceutical industry is charging so much. Mm -hmm. Now, their defense of their high prices for these medications is the high costs of development. But in fact, Many of those drugs have been developed with government support, either from the National Institutes of Health here in the United States or from uh, research organizations in Europe and other parts of the world. And their real costs are for the promotion of drugs and the advertising. And I, I think an important uh, public health battle of the next decade or so will be to set ground rules to ensure that people have the medications they need to save lives. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to look at how this uh, this came about just a little bit before we look at uh, some possible solutions in the face of what seems hopeless as you read the first couple of chapters. But um, it, a couple of things that you note in the history of regulation that turned into deregulation. Uh, first of all, is former Justice Lewis Powell, who was. Um, a member of the ABA, a oh, president of the ABA, and um, board member of 11 corporations, including Philip Morris and Ethel Corporation. Um, and he wrote this memo to the, uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce talking about um, that, that government regulation was an awful thing. Um, and uh, then you look at the history of regulation from Kennedy through uh, Jimmy Carter there were lots of laws passed created for environmental and occupational and consumer protection, and there were agencies created. From 60 to 80, that went on, and then in comes Reagan, and there's a reversal of that. Yes, and I think there are some important lessons for today, that many of those 49 uh, consumer health and environmental safety regulations that were passed between 60 and 80 it was because of the activism of the consumer movement and the environmental protection movement and the general uh, air of the 60s that uh, citizens had a right to expect government to protect them from corporate excess. And then, as you say, we saw a, a very determined corporate effort to roll back those advances. And we need to be thinking in the 21st century how do we revitalize those movements that protect public health and that restore uh, government authority to do what really only government can do, which is to protect public health, that no other uh, societal body has the mandate or the resources to protect public health. Mm -hmm. And expecting the market to do that is really asking it to take on something it's not equipped to do. Uh, corporations have the goal of making money. But if that's going to be their uh, operating principle, then we need some protections. And I think almost everybody agrees that there needs to be some balance between markets and government. But what we've seen in the last 30 years, with the Powell memo being in a marker of the starting point, is a real tilting to the market, uh, assuming uh, many more responsibilities than in other times. So we need to look how we can 
restore that balance for better public health protection. Mm -hmm. Some of the uh, uh, trends that led, uh, economic change that led to the, the changes in health that you talk about are, are part of what happens today, and I, I didn't, I guess I intuitively knew they were there, but you've laid them out very nicely, like short-termism, uh, an emphasis on getting a return on investment quickly is part of big business today. It's just, it, it's part yes, of their and DNA. that explains why uh, drug companies often don't adequately test their new products before releasing them onto the market because they're afraid they'll miss an opportunity to make a billion dollars, which is the revenues from a blockbuster drug. Mm -hmm. And they figure they'll be gone by the time the uh, harmful consequences become known. Mm -hmm. And then financialization is a pattern of accumulation in which profit making occurs increasingly through financial channels, which explains a lot about the Wall Street crash, I guess. Yes, and, and really uh, instead of making products and uh, ensuring that they can sustain markets, they look for uh, quick quick fixes to financial problems, and that's often uh, trading, speculating, uh, selling and buying companies, all of which uh, undermines uh, a corporate responsibility for the consequences of their products. Yeah, and I remember thinking about uh, leveraged buyouts when they were happening, but even more so since the 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 recent uh, election where the uh, they shown sh shown a lot of light on the Bain Capital approach to business that buying out companies and milking them for all they're worth is another part of the trend of of mega corporations. Yes. Well, let's let's try and put a little optimism into the last couple of minutes here. Um, you you talk about the building blocks for a movement, and you, you talked uh, a little bit about the fact that consumer advo advocacy can make a difference. What hope do we have in the face of these powerful mega national corporations? Where, where right. I actually have. Uh, I'm optimistic, and the book I think is ultimately an optimistic book. Mm -hmm. There are millions of people and organizations around the world working to change harmful corporate practices. And as it turns out, the corporate practices that endanger health and contribute to chronic diseases and injuries are also threatening the human environment, undermining democracy, contributing to inequality. So many of our most serious social and political problems uh, in this period have to do with our uh, inadequate oversight of corporations. And so I think there are many people around the world who have an interest in changing that picture. Mm -hmm. And the challenge, of course, is to bring together those groups with common interests who so far have been working mostly separately. I'm particularly optimistic about the food justice movement, where I think we see uh, many, many people in this country concerned about the food, wanting safe, healthy food for their children, concerned about the rising rates of obesity and diabetes, and willing to take action, demanding that companies disclose what's in their products, uh, make healthier products more available, uh, stop advertising unhealthy products to children. So I think uh, we, we have the prospects, the building blocks, as I say in the book, for a comprehensive movement that can challenge what I call the corporate consumption complex and its domination of our politics and economy. This is a great read. We've been talking with Dr. Nick Freudenberg about lethal but legal corporations' consumption and protecting public health. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook. I remind you, if you can't catch our program at the times it airs at 12 noon and 7.30 on Thursday and 6.30 a.m. and 3 on Sundays, you can also find us online on our Facebook page, Good Books Radio. We are underwritten by audiobooks.com. Try it for free. 